Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Could we settle down? I know this is going to be a great one hour, and it's going to be a great one hour of conversation with all of you. So I really want to start on time at 12 sharp. And um, I have a great panel. You could tell they're all men, and I'm the woman moderator, right? And we love the diversity on this panel. Okay, And the essential question that we are all going to be asking is, there are going to be strategic shifts in so many areas, and it's going to be part of our World Economic Forum conversation. But one big shift that we are going to see is in the area of financial landscape. And the key question that all this wonderful panelists will be talking about is, what are the major trends, the new models, and the emerging technologies that are transforming the financial landscape? And in no particular order, but because I am the moderator and I use my chairperson's prerogative, I wanted to start the conversation in a while with Mr. Jeffrey Irwin. He's the CEO and chairman of Asia Pac, head of global investment banking at uh, JP Morgan, and he's based in Hong Kong. And of course, next to him, we will have Mr. Ma Wei Hua, president and CEO of China Merchant Bank, Republic, uh, People's Republic of China. And in Peter Sen's place, because Peter can't make it, we have a wonderful friend, Mr. Jasper Bindra is the group CEO and CEO Asia for Standard Chartered Bank, also based in Hong Kong. Then next to Jasper, we have Mr. Morris Lee. He's the president of China Guangfa Bank. And the two gentlemen from China will be speaking in Mandarin. So do get your headphones ready because we do not want to miss any part of the conversation with them. And last but not least, we wanted someone from that you call the left field, the curveball, someone who would be disruptive and ask him to share with us his thoughts. And that's Mr. Joe Schoendorf, and he's the partner of Excel Partners in USA. So without uh, further ado, can we warmly welcome this great panel that I have put together for all of you. I'm going to start with Jeff first. Jeff, um, Jeff you, you have been in banking for 35 years. 33. But 33 years. Okay, I've added two more while we are sitting here. And in this 33 years, I think, Jeff, the biggest changes have been coming in the last three to four years. Can you share with us what are the big shifts that you are seeing? And, you know, the recent conversation about the role of the euro and the ECB. Give us some thoughts on that. Okay, so first of all, um, it's a privilege to be here today on behalf of J.P. Morgan and uh, thank the World Economic Forum for organizing this event and having such an illustrious panel. Um, you know, in the 33 years that I've been in the business, or as my wife keeps reminding me, the five decades that I've been active in banking from 1979 to date, um, I've seen a huge amount of change. Um, it has accelerated in the last few years. Clearly, the uh, financial crisis that we hit in 2007 had a massive impact on confidence in the banking system around the world. And, you know, part of the reaction to that was a, a, a dramatic increase in regulatory oversight and in regulatory reform. We still haven't seen all the implications of that. We're still working our way through it. Um, but it's something that's clearly going to be a dominant feature through the remainder of my career and many of my, my, my younger colleagues. Um, I would say that um, most of the bankers that I know believe that regulatory reform was essential. Everybody believes that we need a strong, well-capitalized, and liquid banking system. Um, I think what many bankers do want to see, though, is that regulatory reform is done in a thoughtful and even-handed way, that there's a level playing field for everybody, um, and that uh, where multiple regulators are involved, uh, that they avoid contradictions in regulatory oversight. You know, it's interesting. I run global investment banking for J.P. Morgan, including the U.S., and I recently moved to Hong Kong to take over the uh, chairman and chief executive role for Asia Pacific, in addition to running global banking. And one of the things that really surprised me was just how many regulators I had to deal with. Uh, J.P. Morgan is present in 14 countries, from India uh, right away across to Australia, and we deal with approximately 120 different regulators in that region. Uh, so it really is quite staggering how many different regulators, how much potential there is there for contradiction between different regular, regulatory regimes. 
Um, looking at sort of the you know, evolution of investment banking, you know, one of the things I looked at, I uh, probably have a slight investment banking bias here for obvious reasons. One of the things I looked at was just how much the landscape has changed in the last five years. And one of, one of the uh, comments just made was that, we're, that, that uh, change has accelerated in the last five years. And I think that's pretty much, uh, that's pretty much correct. You know, if you looked at, just looking at IB fee wallet globally, and you looked at the top 15 financial institutions, the top 15 banks that are active in investment banking, it's interesting that four banks have dropped off the 15 list. Pretty obviously, Lehman Brothers, Merrill Lynch, ABN AMRO, and Wachovia. Um, three in the US, uh, one, one uh, in Europe. And they've been replaced by one from Hong Kong, one from the US, one from Canada, and one from Europe. That would be um, Wells Fargo, um, HSBC, Nomura, uh, and uh, Royal Bank of Canada. Um, so we're seeing a change in that, in that landscape. Secondly, if you looked at the top, fifth, uh, the top five banks uh, in, in investment banking fee wallet uh, over the last five years, uh, you see that their share of the wallet has actually slipped from about 33% to 30%. That's actually a massive shift when you, when you really translate it into fees and into domination of, uh, of market. And what it shows is we're getting a bigger diversification of players in that top league, uh, share, sharing more of the wallets, so less concentration at the top, more players, larger, larger diversification. Um, third thing I just mentioned is the uh, emergence of Chinese banks. The 18 uh, uh, Chinese banks, again, we're looking at investment banking fee wallet, have seen their share of Asia-Pacific uh, IB fees um, grow from 4% to uh, 17% uh, in the last five years. So really important uh, emergence of uh, Chinese banks outside of China as well. Um, cross-border, cross-regional M&A fees. You know, I often use, I usually use M&A as really uh, a very good proxy for the state of the market and, and what, uh, what's really happening. Um, and when you look at cross-regional M&A, it's really giving, giving you a lot of insight into uh, corporate confidence and capital flows. And one of the things that um, you know, I just point out, if you looked at M&A volume, uh, it peaked at 2007 at about $830 billion uh, of deal value. Uh, this is cross-regional M&A. Um, and uh, declined pretty, pretty rapidly to 620 in 2007. Uh, 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 2008, sorry, and really fell off a cliff in 2009 when we had the low point in confidence in the system at about 320 billion. Again, con contrast that with uh, 830 billion at the peak. It's re recovering this year. We'll probably see about 600 billion of cross regional MA, uh, but significantly below that peak of 2007. And again, if you looked at where that MA is really occurring, you'd see a pretty big spike in energy and in technology, uh, pretty much doubling in the last three years and, and quadrupling since, uh, since that, uh, 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 sorry, uh, doubling the last two years and quadrupling since that real low point uh, in 2009. Um, corporate loan demand, uh, you know, people keep saying to me, well, the banks aren't lending. So I, I chaired uh, J.P. Morgan's um, loan committee for the last, uh, last four years in the U.S., uh, currently chaired in, in Europe. And the U.S., which is really the core of our market, um, you know, gives, gives a pretty good indication. Uh, we we uh, have increased our lending every year since 2009. If you looked at corporate loan volume, uh, you know, in 2011, uh, it was about $1.9 trillion uh, and growing. And actually, we surpassed that in August of 2012. So in, in eight months of 2012, we surpassed the record high volume of 2011. Uh, so pretty significant. So I think, um, I think one of the trends we're going to see, one of the things I keep telling my, my uh, young bankers is that uh, you know, our business is not really driven by proprietary trading. It's not driven by uh, you know, derivatives and all the other sort of fancy things. It's driven by client demand. It's driven by servicing our corporate clients, um, whether that's in our treasury services business, whether it's in asset management, uh, whether it's in you know, debt or, or equity raising or mergers and acquisition advice. Uh, we follow the clients. Um, and what we are seeing is, you know, increased activity, again, by clients on a cross-border basis, increased activity in the capital markets. The equity markets continue to be a little more challenged than the debt markets. 
with record low interest rates, we're seeing record volumes of debt issuance. Um, and again, I think the, the shape of investment banks is really changing uh, to service that evolving client base. Good. Jeff, I'm going to ask you to hold on the role of the euro because we want to hear from Mr. Ma uh, very quickly. But I want to ask you to take a look at a crystal ball. Next five years, do you see China or Asian players in the top five in investment banking? Not in, not in the top five, um, but I think you'll see more than one Chinese player in the top 15. That's for sure. Thank you. That brings me nicely to Mr. Ma. Uh, Mr. Ma, you know, with the growth in China and your 12 years in China Merchant Bank, can you share with us what is the vision of the role of the Chinese banks in the world economy and what's the role of banks in China's growth right now? Well, I'd like to thank all the members of audience uh, for your turnout and for your tremendous uh, uh, interest. And uh, this afternoon, this afternoon we're going to have a business council uh, session. We're going to talk about uh, how to get away from the worries of the eurozone. Uh, uh, crisis. We do not have a panacea to solve uh, that crisis, but uh, for all the previous financial uh, crisis, we would rely on technology and innovation to work out of those um, uh, crises. As history indicates, I think the banking sector in China is a latecomer. We have had a short history of only three decades, while the traditional Western banks have had uh, centuries of uh, history. And, uh, we are confronted with uh, numerous challenges as well. I think a very important opportunity in front of us is the third industrial revolution. I think it's uh, uh, proposed uh, by an, uh, an American economist, which means that information technology will inject uh, a new momentum into the global economy. I think the IT-driven revolution will bring new momentum to the economy, Moreover, it will change our way of life. Changing our way of life will bring about a fresh demand for the modern banking sector or the change in the modern banking sector. For the banking sector in China, despite a very brief history, being confronted by the new technology revolution, all banks, incumbent and emerging, are at the same playing field. And 10 years ago, inspired by Bill Gates, I started the retail banking business, and which was a phenomenal success. Bill Gates said 10 years ago that without changes, traditional banks would become dinosaurs in the 21st century. So, as an emerging bank instead of an incumbent, we should not be following the steps of the others. Then we would like to focus on retail banking. At the very beginning, we have only uh, 200 branch organizations. At present, we have just over 900 branch organizations all across China, very few. But leveraging the internet, we have achieved our dreams. We have realized our dreams. And we have been ranked as the best retail bank in China for uh, many times, um, despite a, a small network. Uh, however, we have a 90% internet uh, business substitution rate uh, for the physical channels. And, uh, uh, given our client structure, our channels are as effective as uh, those biggest banks in China as well. And we are confronted with a fresh uh, challenge. With the evolution uh, from mainstream to PC, uh, we are also ushering into a new stage of uh, mobile internet with mobile finance. Uh, we saw the IPO of uh, Facebook uh, some time ago, and uh, the banks found a lot of challenges from those new players. And in the internet age, with the help of the search engine, with the help of uh, uh, mobile, uh, 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 the cloud computing, the mobile devices, and uh, the credit bureau uh, kind of credit reporting, especially in the case of uh, Facebook, which uh, has uh, 840 uh, clients, uh, many of uh, uh, whom uh, have a demand for funding, and they can leverage internet to access finance directly without any matchmaker in between. 
Therefore, the challenge for the banking sector is really severe. I've also noticed three emerging trends. First, mobile payment. In my view, mobile payment is going to replace the traditional approaches. If you look at the global mobile online, last year the amount increased to around 145 million. So perhaps by 2015, the total payments will have amounted to 1 trillion US dollars, accounting for 2% of the global payment. However, that is a dynamic area of development. Second, Different forms of loaning. Previously, banks were the only sources of loaning. However, loaning everywhere means loaning through internet. And my friend is going to give you more details about online loaning. So this can provide us with solutions of privacy issues, such as imbalanced information and high risks. So this form of loaning, in my view, can help us resolve all the previous problems, minimizing transaction costs and enhancing information transparency and protecting controls over risks. In addition, they can provide custom-based services and greater freedom. Previously, it was the management and it was the business community that is applying for loaning. But in the future, almost everybody can apply for loaning. In 2005, I believe the UK had its first practice in this area, but now we noticed in China many new organizations are coming up. Third, financing through different channels. In other words, internet is a good source of financing for investment projects. So internet is gradually replacing the functions of the investment banks. In the age of cloud computing, this also means that the suppliers of the financing can actually provide financing through internet. And then through search engines, all the information can be collected and released real time. And precisely the risk pricing and default situations for all the demanding side can be informed to the suppliers. So I believe that is another risk for the investment banking sector. Imagine a big project, a profitable project. Many investors will be able to join in. In the United States, there is an institution called Casta, which has been in running for three years attracting altogether 2 million investors, providing 250 million US dollars for 24,000 projects, a very dynamic sector. These three emerging trends, in my view, present challenges not only to the traditional banking sector, but also the investment banking sector. It is true that we have technological, technological um, assumptions, but those assumptions need logic. It's almost like the explosive power of the internet and the power's influence on the commercial banking sector. The same is true in front of us. Facing the new challenges, how can China's banking sector play out its full potential? Apart from relying on China's economic transformation and the transformation of the banking sector, there are more things that we need to do. China's economy has been growing by more than 10% annually, so is China's credit size. But previously, we relied on VIP clients, large size loaning. But right now, perhaps we need to resort to more technologi technology contents in China economic growth. And to do that, the banking sector needs to leverage on new technologies, especially new technologies that can provide an impetus to China's retail banking and China's consumption-based banking so that consumption can be the most vital force Thank you very much, Mr. Ma. I would like to follow up with a question very quickly. So this is very much driven by consumption-based banking. Is the government of China ready for such a wave in banking change? 
Which, to be honest, it tends to be the commercial sector or the banking sector driving forward the mindset change in the government sector. Innovation always comes from the business sector. The government is taking a proactive approach. For instance, if you look at the banking regulatory approach in China, the approach is based on different subsectors. However, a comprehensive approach has been adopted by the government and the regulatory authorities. Authorities and many measures have taken place. In terms of globalization of China's banking sector, the government has also provided more supportive measures. As I've mentioned, in the outbreak of the financial crisis, the government is focused more on domestic demand. To drive the most strict demand, what is more is a consumption-based loaning provided by the banking sector, and that involves many policy factors. For instance, um, policies for SMEs. So that's an issue under consideration for the government and different regulatory authorities. Many policy supporting measures have come up, including measures for risk-based investment, provisioning policy, risk foundation, and guarantee companies, etc. All of these will facilitate China's consumption-based banking sector. But what matters more is to respond to the needs of technological change and transform the traditional model. Thank you very much. We love what we are hearing. And I'm going to move to Jasper. Jasper, you've been in banking for a long time. I'm trying to count the number of years as we progress. 25. 25. And He's a youngster. He's a youngster, right, compared, <laughs> compared to you, Jeff. Um, just while I think it sounds like music to your ears, what you've been hearing about the shifts, the change, and from where you sit, from Standard Chartered's point of view, um, you know, how do you see the changes, and do you think technology is the main driver? Sure. Thank you, Annie. Uh, firstly, it's a pleasure to be here. I'll highlight four shifts that are taking place. The first is the increased demand for funding from two new sources. The first being as economic activity center of gravity moves to the east, there is going to be a very large demand of funding in the east, in the emerging markets of the world. The second, in the west, the demand is going to come less from the private sector, but a very large demand is going to originate from the government who needs to spend for fiscal and because of demographic pressure. So I think we're going to see two new trends in terms of whether demand for funding is going to come. The second, Jeffrey touched upon the multiple regulations and the challenges that creates. I'll add to that one more challenge which is as the banking industry gets more intensely regulated and is compelled to have a higher cost of capital and deleverage, therefore, we are going to see some of this increased funding demand being met by players in the unregulated or underregulated sector, which will lead to shadow banking. And I think that has its own issues around it both good and bad. What, what will be some of the key players who are in this shadow banking arena? I could put them in two categories, Annie. One is in the retail side. There will, of course, be the tel telcos. There will be the retailers, and there will be the internet giants. And I think on the wholesale side, there will be the hedge funds, the private equity players, and the commodity players. So I think those would be the... The third, uh, and probably the most immediate shift, as I think both the speakers before me mentioned, is going to come from technology. I think the social connectivity, the sophisticated data analytics and modeling, the wide reach and penetration that is possible through technology is going to, or is promising, to change the landscape of banking. You know, everything we've done conventionally is going to get disrupted. Uh, I think most people will do if not all, their business through mobile. It is estimated that by 2015, there will be a billion mobile banking customers. In that same period, the value that will be transacted through mobile bill, um, banking 
is estimated to cross a trillion US dollars. So it's clearly big moves there. And this is all happening here. It's happening in Asia. 69% of the consumers in Asia are willing to do m-commerce on mobile compared to only 23% in the United States and Germany. So it's, it's going to happen big time here. It'll be similar technology transformation in payment system. You know, Google already, or sorry, Facebook already earns 500 million US dollars uh, just on um, uh, payments every year. So I think there is going to be a lot of change. In fact, uh, there will be some disintermediation for banks uh, because there will be certain things technology can do which banks will not or cannot do. And Google Wallet is a good example where they don't have to have a banking account or an internet account and you can transact through Google Wallet. The last uh, shift I would talk about is that, and this is probably more relevant in the West than it is relevant here today, is the growing trust deficit between society at large and the banking industry. And to me, the consequence of that is that in the future generation, we are going to find it very difficult to attract good talent into the banking industry. As this trust deficit grows, you know, pre the crisis, the banks were considered irresponsible when it came to compensation. When the crisis happened, the banks were considered not only responsible for compensation, but also irresponsible in the way they ran their models, you know, low liquidity, low capital, etc. Almost to the point of being incompetent. But now banks have graduated from irresponsible and incompetent behavior. They've become unethical. I don't know how far it goes. I mean, you have to get criminal after this, but that's the growing trust deficit, which will definitely impact future talent joining banking. I'd like to do a little poll on the audience based on that last statement. How many of you are telling your children not to join banking? <laughs> Hands up for those who are telling your children not to join banking. And the rest of you? It's still a good industry. See, Jasper, there's a future for finance. Okay, we'll come to Mr. Morris Lee. And I think, Morris, for you, we really want to know um, the ambitions for Chinese banks. Do you think they are, you know, hoping, aspiring to grow global? And I'm going to sneak this one in. What is the role of the renminbi in world finance? Okay. It's my great delight to be here at today's forum. On a personal note, I do have my unique perspectives. China Guangfa Bank is one of the earliest listed commercial banks in China. It is headquartered in Guangzhou, and then in 2006, it introduced a reform, introducing foreign investors such as Citibank, State Grid, Citibank, etc. On behalf of the Citibank, I am the president of CGB. As the main manager of my bank, as the previous foreign friends, I'm actually representing the city bank in order to make greater progress in our bank's reform process. So in that, on that very note, I believe I need to learn from President Ma. I was born in Taiwan. And I'm actually the first Taiwanese that is able to be the president of a large Chinese commercial bank. So I do take up unique roles. I am a native Chinese, but I do have some time to adapt to the local Chinese culture. Back to the moderator's question. So from the west to the east, we've noticed that in the past few years, especially since 2007, in the aftermath, of the financial crisis and the debt crisis, there are two emerging, two imminent challenges in front of the Western banks that is re-engineering in terms of cost and efficiency. There is large-scale re-engineering project underway across the Western banking sector. The other thing is repositioning the corporate culture. 
大家都刚刚主持人提到过，还有马梅的 Jasper 提到过，就是大家对银行的信任，他是呢消费者对银行的信任。So we've also witnessed an eroded uh, confidence. The international banks, um, especially, uh, especially European and American ones, are repositioning that bank culture, that corporate culture. And uh, if you take a look at uh, the East, uh, uh, especially uh, Chinese banks, they are still in the process of uh, transitioning and upgrading. From 2007 to 2011, the banking sector in China has been growing very rapidly, with most uh, banks have, having enjoyed 30% uh, plus year-on-year -year growth. But with the euro uh, crisis and the slowdown of the U.S. recovery for uh, Chinese banks, it is a very good opportunity for them to reposition their extensive strategy of uh, growth, uh, their size-centric strategy of growth over the past five years, to rethink about the strategy. And uh, with the uh, slowdown of external demand, foreign trade, and the external economies, uh, the momentum of a slowdown is also here for the banking sector. And the banking sector in China also, like other sectors in China, has to restructure itself. Uh, from a very crude way of growth uh, to a more refined way of growth. And uh, they should refine uh, themselves, that they should pursue differentiation, they should pursue more retail banking and SME banking. And they should also lead by uh, IT infrastructure, uh, technology, and IT-enabled services in order to serve their new client base of retail customers and SMEs, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises. So that's the uh, most important uh, topic or the, the theme for Chinese banks for the next five years. So there are different focuses of reform in China and in elsewhere in the world. But uh, the demand for capital, the demand uh, for uh, de capital adequacy is the same. The, the Western banks are talking about uh, Basel III. And in China, the CBRC has issued a new capital management regulation for the banks. And the CBRC regulation in uh, to some extent, it's even more stringent than Basel III in terms of uh, capital, uh, capital uh, adequacy management. And for the onshore market uh, here in China, uh, the Chinese government uh, has been opening up the market further, and the uh, uh, Chinese government, starting uh, from, the, uh, from July of 2005, uh, started to adopt uh, Manage uh, floating system to govern its exchange rate regime. And from July 2005 uh, to this year, the band of uh, fluctuation has been broadened. In April this year, the band has been widened from 0.5% to 1% for the band of uh, fluctuation for the RMB's exchange rate. What impact has it had on the market? The RMB has been more incorporated into the uh, global uh, financial a system. That's a macro trend to uh, follow. And second, with that change, resources can be allocated in a more effective way. And I think uh, timing, timing is always the key. When there's economic slowdown, whether, when there's trade slowdown, it's a good opportunity to press ahead with market reforms and market openness uh, to better allocate resources more efficiently. And uh, with greater fluctuation of the exchange rate, the currency is becoming more independent, the monetary policy is becoming more independent. And number four, on the plus side, uh, China can make use of this opportunity to rebalance uh, its trade position, uh, its excessive uh, trade surplus, in order to search for uh, equilibrium uh, uh, in terms of the right level of uh, surplus. And uh, in June, uh, Chinese government initiated a major reform to liberalize its interest rate uh, policy, allowing for a 10% uh, range uh, for uh, the banks uh, to hike their uh, interest rate. And uh, in uh, June, the uh, interest rate, uh, official interest rate was lowered, but at the same time, the uh, interest rate uh, has been uh, liberalized to some extent. So 
What has been the impact on the banking sector in China in its process of transitioning and updating? It has served as yet another catalyst to push for further reforms. Given the squeeze, net interest margin or interest spread because of the liberalization, for them to pursue more SME banking, retail banking, and fee-based businesses. And uh, all uh, the uh, investment bank uh, uh, or businesses are similar to investment uh, banking. So there's been further opening in terms of the market of uh, products and of uh, the business activities. Those reforms have had a profound impact on the banking sector in China. And second, uh, between banking uh, financial institutions and non-banking financial institutions, the relationship has evolved uh, substantially as well. Now uh, there is a cross cooperation and competition uh, uh, between uh, trust companies, insurance companies. And payment companies and payment platforms on the one hand and banks on the other. Usually, most payers, most people would still uh, place their confidence on the banking channel. That is to say, many products will still have to be run by uh, bank channels. But at the same time, non-banking financial institutions are becoming uh, more of a competitor against the traditional banks. Competition, uh, cooperation, competition, and uh, uh, coexistence of uh, cooperation and competition in uh, some cases. Therefore, Chinese banks should leverage technology and uh, services to pursue uh, vehicle business opportunities. Uh, although regulation is still provided uh, uh, in a vehicle-specific way, but in the future, the uh, products can penetrate uh, different uh, platforms, like uh, banks, insurers, uh, asset management, wealth management, uh, trust companies, so on and so forth. So th that's a macro trend towards consolidation, towards competition. And the final outcome will be determined by the clients and by the market uh, so as to, in, in so far as which platform will be the preferred one in offering a comprehensive set of financial and wealth management services. So for the further development of financial services in China, within the next uh, five years, the industry will grow bigger and uh, larger and it's going to be an extremely good opportunity for the banking sector in China to evolve from a crude way of growth to a refined Way of growth. In further developing SME banking and uh, retail banking, it's a good opportunity for them as well, and uh, they can catch up with uh, uh, American and European banks as well, because uh, those American and European banks are repositioning, uh, repositioning their bank culture and uh, well, exercising more capital restraints on themselves. And in offering uh, e-banking or the, uh, mobile banking, the Chinese banks have a good opportunity to leapfrog the stage of having to build too many physical infrastructure, of, of having to you know, put together bricks and mortar to build uh, physical branches or outlets. You, you don't have to do that. In the case of uh, Guangdong Development Bank, we are offering a smart banking uh, services or kind of a, a smart kind of uh, presence for our banking uh, service uh, to give uh, the clients a good experience. And also, we are leveraging mobile banking or internet banking or mobile payment tools, uh, devices to cover uh, more, to offer more services uh, to more clients. I think this is a major leapfrog opportunity for Chinese banks. Thank you very much. I think this, this whole conversation, you know, is like bringing us to the world that you like, right, Joe? Are you happy with this? I mean, you, you talk about disruptive innovation and you would like to see, you know, great changes in the landscape. Is this good enough for you? Well, uh, it's an opportunity, let me just say that. Uh, let me uh, start off, though, with another comment. Uh, I'm here for two reasons. One, to be at your meeting of the annual meeting of New Champions, where also I am on the board of directors, the foundation board of the World Economic Forum. And uh, this next year will be my 18th summer Davos, and I have been to every Davos here. I want to just tell you by walking around this morning and going into some of the sessions and sitting here, the energy level, the quality of the presentations that we're seeing uh, is at a minimum 
to not hurt anybody's feeling as good as anything you're going to see at any other Davos meeting. So I congratulate you for that. You really built something wonderful here. Keep going. I'm going to report back to the board on that this afternoon. Um, I feel like the old man on this panel. I'm coming up. Um, I've just crossed my 46th year in Silicon Valley in Palo Alto. And I've done everything from work at a big company, Hewlett Packard. I was VP of marketing at Apple. I started my own company. And for the last 25 years, I've been in venture capital. And what we do in venture capital is we look for great entrepreneurs who have really big ideas who want to change the world. Uh, I won't take you through our history, but about six years ago, a young fellow came in who was 19 years old, who was a sophomore in college, who would never really had a job, had never managed anybody, wanted us to give him $10 million. He thought he could change the world through building a social network that a lot of people would use. His name was Mark Zuckerberg. We wrote the check. The company is Facebook. Now, that's a great story of disruption, and I probably can't say a lot more about it because I'm not sure exactly where I am on, uh, on our lockup as a lead investor. <laughs> but building disruptive companies is what Silicon Valley Venture Capital has been about, and finding great entrepreneurs to do that is our central mission. Now, let me give you a couple of major thinking points about how we're looking at the world today and why I think finance is, the financial industry is so ripe. First of all, basic rule, basic fact. Half of the world is under 28 years old. The, the median age of the world is 27.6 years. I don't know what the median age in this room is, but uh, how many of you have been inside of a bank to do a transaction in the last 90 days? I don't see a lot of hands. If, the, if, the, if, if, if we were all under 28, I don't think we'd see any hands go up. Mm. To use an old Apple expression, the new generation really does think different. Uh, tomorrow, by the way, is going to be an inflection point in the, in the future of a lot of things, but with the iPhone 5 announcement, and the technologies of Passbook and things that are built into that, most of the people who use it will be able to do everything from buy things to borrow money without getting anywhere near a bank. Uh, to give you an idea about disruption, I want to just give you some names. For the first 20 or 30 years of my career, the disruption occurred in the technology industry, and we ate our own, so to speak. When I started in the mid-60s, we had IBM and what were called the Seven Dwarfs, who I don't think anybody's even heard of. They were the competitors in the mainframe world. And now even IBM has transformed itself and is no longer in the personal computer business uh, and is no longer the number one computer company in the world. And we went down through the whole technology list, and we lost companies like Compact and Sun, and it just keeps going. And then 20 years ago, uh, the Internet was turned over to the public. It was just 20 years ago, just about right now. And we built, we happened to invest in one of the first Internet connectivity companies, and that started another major set of disruptions outside of technology. The first to fall was media you started to watch the decline of magazines, you started to watch the decline of newspapers. If I'd have told you 20 years ago when the first internet connectivity hooked up that most bookstores were going to go away, would you have believed me? Look what's happened. The next major disruption in media was in photography. My wife also happens to be a venture capitalist, and she uh, started a company called Shutterfly. It wasn't in business in the late 90s. Last week, they bought the remaining assets of Kodak's digital camera business and their digital online business. So here you had a global brand. Can anybody think of a city you ever went into 
where you didn't see the yellow and red Kodak symbol. And I, I challenge you a year from now to find one anywhere. So media disruption was next. Then along came Jeff Bezos. And he said, I'm going to change retail. And I want to tell you we're just at the beginning of that. Right now, $1 out of 10 in the U.S. is done online. Retail in brick and mortar stores is flat to down. Retail online is growing at double digit rates. Um, let me tell you, there are, there are a number of industries, and particularly in the service business, that are next. As we go to a world where 20 years ago nobody was on the internet, other than a few government students and people that worked in labs and university uh, people, and now we have three billion, you know, rapidly headed to four billion. We have a world where 15 years ago there were less than a billion mobile phones to a world where in, uh, by the end of this decade all but a billion people will have a mobile device. And so in that world, you look at industries that have the opportunity to become slowly and then completely restructured. Uh, let me risk uh, creating some controversy here for a minute. One of the reasons we like the finance industry, if let me give you some U.S. numbers. Uh, the bank, the financial sector in the U.S., and I don't have global numbers, has about 10% of the value add of our GDP. In 2001, they made 46% of the profits. Now, that went down to zero in the collapse year of 2008, but I looked at the fourth quarter numbers, the last ones that were reported for 2011, and they were back to almost 30%. 10% value add, 30% of the profit. Opportunity for disruption. Uh, I told you that the young people don't go to banks. One of the ways, you know, and I'm not a a predictor. Uh, what we, we think about opportunities. You know, I said to you, I think there's an opportunity for disruption in service industries. I gave you the history of technology, of media, uh, uh, of retail. Uh, but one of the things that we do is we have a prepared mind, and we get, I don't know, 100 business plans a day on the Internet. And I, I, I like to read through the first paragraph and just see what space people are working in. Mobile is still the largest. Things that are mobile, there are still, we haven't begun to see the beginning of ideas in this area. And one of the big subcategories is all kinds of financial transactions that you can do with mobile devices. I want to tell you quickly about two companies that we have started. Uh, and I personally was a little dubious about this, but one of the things I've learned to do is look at results and say, hey, guy was right. He had a good idea. There's a company in the UK called Wonga. And you can go on the site, W-O-N-G-A, and I, I, this is not about promoting the company because there are competitors to Wonga that are in the same space. Mm -hmm. But you can sign up. We'll identify you. You put in your relevant information. And with some proprietary technology, we will loan you money and put it into your banking account within 30 minutes of when you've been on the site or tell you we're not going to. And our loss rate for this kind of a business is far lower than the loss rate for any of the major banks in London where the company operates. And the, the entrepreneur has already built a hundred million pound a month business in loaning money to people for short periods of time. Uh, there's another company in the U.S. that we started a couple of years ago called Prosper. I like it because it's a peer-to-peer -peer loaning. So you go on, and, and, and a number of people, again, there are a number of competitors here, and you say you want to borrow money, and you've been qualified, and you say, I want $20,000, and we've, you know, we've classified you who you are, and we verified you. You can go on the line as a, loaner, as a lender, and you can look at the people who want to borrow money and say, I'll put $100 in that, and $50 in that, and $25 in that, and you've got this peer-to-peer real-time market for loaning, lending, again, Strong growth, good results. Early stage. Early stage.
But what you have going on is, as I told you, half the world under 28, all but a billion people headed to a mobile device. Uh, I'm just going to say uh, not a culture of using banks. I'm not going to use the word distrust. That's been talked about enough. But I think an industry which is ready for significant change, if I had more time, I'd tell you about a number of other companies that are going on. Uh, some of them will make it, some of them won't. But my main count is to say there's an awful lot of entrepreneurs with out-of-the-box ideas who are attacking all segments of this industry. Thank you, Joe. I'm going to try and quickly get to the panel, then open to the floor. Having heard what Joe has said, you folks who are in the finance and banking industry, are you scared? Are you worried? Or no. The change has to say happen. No, say no. We like that. <laughs> <laughs> the change has to happen. So what are you doing about it if that is the shift that you're it, it, hearing? It's not a question of being scared. It's a question of uh, you know, having, having to um, invest pretty significantly in technology to anticipate some of these changes. These changes are even more dramatic when you get into our wholesale businesses and the disintermediation of uh, exchanges and other, other uh, intermediaries. Um, it's involving massive investment, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, I believe that invest investment banking particularly is still driven by the client and driven by the client needs and driven by people relationships. Joe, you want to counter that? Uh, banking and financial services is a huge, huge market. And I think you're exactly right. Uh, but I think, like anything else, you know, Jeff Bezos started the retail business by what? Becoming a book company. And he just wanted to replace the retail book segment. And now, you know, he's, he's threatened almost every retail store that there is. Uh, I think investment banking is way, way down the list. I think the things that are going on with with retail banking, with borrowing money, with peer-to-peer -peer lending is much lower hanging fruit. Yes, Morris. I think what really matters is to provide the best service and to have the best um, targeting market segments. The model can be applied into any banking unit, or it can be done through the cooperation between the banking and non-banking sectors. What really matters is for this model to be precise in terms of its technology, its target segments, service efficiency, etc. What really matters is for this particular banking institution to become the best in its industry. Thank you. Can we now open up to the floor? Um, put up. Yes, I have a hand there. The uh, lady, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm from NetEase Financial Channel. My question is to Mr. Ma. We look at the financial statements in the early part of this year. We've noticed that compared with other industries, the banking sector still has a big profit. But I also noticed that the growth rate for listed banks is relatively slow. Does it mean the high growth and high profitability age for Chinese banking sector? has come to its end. You are right. The mid-half report for Chinese banking sector indicated that the growth rate for banks' profitability has slowed down. This is easy to follow due to the following reasons. First, the macro environment, the economic environment in China is different. In the past 30 years, China's economy witnessed high growth rate. However, in the first half of this year, the growth rate was reduced to 7.8%. This is actually quite natural, affected by the euro debt crisis. And as a result of the delivery of the macroeconomic regulation targets, it's impossible for the economy to be always on a fast track. The economy needs to be focused on greater efficiency and quality. Second, the banking sector is also facing a market, the interest rate marketization issue. In the first half of this year, uh, the borrowing amount in the bank was reduced to 11.9%. 
So where does the money go? The money actually goes to non-banking sector, other sectors in the financial, in the capital market, such as private loaning or private equity fund. This is not a bad thing because the advanced capital market will be a good thing to the banking sector. And the narrowing margin will certainly affect the banking sector, which is also a result of the accelerated marketization of China's interest rate. Third, different demand from the market. While the government is having macroeconomic control, public and private demand are different. And we are trying to expand the market demand. However, the governmental policies and measures are not fully in place. In this context, coupled by the bank's own reform, uh, the slowdown in the banking sector is nothing but natural. In my view, even as of now, the profitability growth in the Chinese banking sector is still topping the world. Although we recognize that uh, the banks can still produce a large amount of profits. I believe that along with China's economic transformation and banking reform, banks in China still enjoy a promising future. The previous speakers were talking about technological change. I believe that the banking sector has a natural appealing for IT revolution. Every round of information technology has its influence, has had its influence in the banking sector. Thank you. So that presents I, I, both challenges and We are running out of time. I can only take uh, one or two questions. Maybe that lady and then gentleman. All right. Uh, the lady in white? Yes. Uh, my question is also directed to Mr. Ma. Sorry, that should be the uh, lady. Well, thank you. And uh, I'm a journalist from China Business News and also a sponsor of this uh, forum. And my first question is for Jeffrey. And, uh, you have only one question. You cannot have two <laughs> questions. <So> okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, just one. Um, that we, we know that during, 2007, uh, du during 2011 and this year, the investment banking has been experiencing a kind of a hardship. Uh, so do you think uh, it's a time for Chinese investment banking to go abroad to do some uh, uh, MA or to increase or... Uh, Capabilities. Thank you. Yeah, actually, if you, if you looked at global investment banking, it's um, performing reasonably well, sustained in large part by the U.S., which is still quite active, even though we've had a turn down in confidence, uh, this fiscal cliff that people have talked about that happens at the end of this year, or potentially happens at the end of this year, certainly impacting CEO and board confidence and reducing M&A. Um, but the debt capital markets in the U.S., with record low interest rates, are on fire. And... Uh, you know, that's compensating to some extent. In Asia, it's, it's really quite different because about 70% of the investment banking fee wallet uh, comes from the equity product. And we've had a really significant decline uh, in foreign investor interest in, uh, in equities, particularly uh, IPOs, uh, which has had a big impact on the total IB fee wallet. I think that's temporary. Um, uh, I think it'll rebound. Um, doesn't mean we're going back to... Uh, the 2010, 2011, early 2011 levels, um, uh, but I do think it'll rebound. I think the Chinese investment banks uh, will be significant competitors, whatever happens. Um, we're seeing that in China. There's a, a, a fairly restricted access for foreign investment banks uh, within China, and the Chinese investment banks have used that um, uh, lack of competition from the foreign banks as an opportunity to really develop technologies and develop their businesses in a very impressive way. And it is only a question of time till uh, they follow their clients, their Chinese clients, who are investing and making acquisitions outside of China. So I think that's, that's a natural uh, uh, occurrence anyway. And, uh, uh, you know, actually I welcome the competition. I think it's healthy. Thank you. Quick one from the young man. There, no, there was a gentleman who was up there. I'm, uh, I'm from Huaxia newspaper. My question is addressed to Mr. Ma. Mr. Ma, I think you are very sensitive to the growing trend of the banking sector. I noticed a media report saying that uh, the banking sector 
is more engaged in the online transaction. It's not actually referring to online transactions and social networking. So my question is about the construction bank and the transportation bank, which is largely involved in e-commerce. What's your comment? Alibaba is doing a small amount of loans. Uh, what is your comment? And for Mr. Ma, do you have any strategy to respond to this new trend? For instance, in terms of e-commerce, is it allowable by policy? Thank you. Uh, to be, please be brief. I, I think I have already addressed this question. As I said, uh, the uh, banks are part of the service sector, and for a service sector company, you should pay attention to two points. First, your client base. What are the evolving and changing needs in your client base in the era of mobile finance and mobile internet? Everyone with a mobile device does not want to visit your banks. They want to access bank service anytime, anywhere. So you've got to satisfy such demands, such requirements. So for bank and non-bank financial institutions, both of them should focus on this new trend. And second, you should pay attention to your own technology base. How can you use your technology infrastructure to satisfy such demands? IT is very important part of the bank business. IT is like oxygen, it's like air to the banks. We have to have very good IT to satisfy your customers' demands. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we've got a great panel here. Can we put our hands together and sign them for the insights? Technology and finance go hand in hand together. Thank you.